They are gone, but hardly forgotten. Spectacular stretches of twisting asphalt and rutted ovals of dirt that served as battlegrounds for some of the greatest races in American motorsports history. They are no more. The victims of changing times, shifting attitudes, and the crush of burgeoning populations. They are the lost racetracks of the nation. Once famed venues for competition that have either turned to dust or have been transformed into backwater obsolescence. A lost racetrack uh, in a, is a place where big time racing, where people showed up uh, for sometimes for years and years, decades in some cases, and then for reasons of uh, economy, uh, changing population patterns, uh, uh, different tastes in sport, whatever, uh, they died, disappeared. For, uh, and it, unfortunately, a racetrack is easy to get rid of. Just bring a big D9 cat bulldozer in, and in a couple of days it's gone, and nobody can remember that it was there even a decade later. This is the story of three of those once great tracks. Tracks where the best and most courageous drivers behind the wheels of the fastest cars of the day fought the good fight, always facing the long odds posed by these immortal speedways. Two of them were located in Southern California in the very heart of the nation's automotive culture. The third lay in the rural backwaters of upstate New York, 3,000 miles away. Watkins Glen, where modern American road racing was born in 1948, was nearly 10 years old when the two California tracks opened. One, a vast road course at Riverside that rivaled any in Europe. The other, Ascot Park, a wild half-mile dirt track that carried on the heritage of intense competition that had arrived on the motorsports scene in crazy Southern California half a century earlier. Now, they are gone overlaid with commercial development or relegated to long ignored stretches of rural highway. But the names Riverside, Ascot, and Watkins Glen live on in automobile racing lore, long after their descent into obsolescence. Join us now as we revisit these immortal places, places that stand at the very top of the pantheon of lost racetracks. In 1957, Riverside, California was a forgotten town in the high desert 50 miles east of Los Angeles, known for little else than orange groves and months of sun-drenched, dusty summer heat. Outside the booming real estate market of Southern California, Riverside offered cheap land for what was planned to be the premier road racing circuit in the United States. Riverside International Raceway was intended as a multi-purpose track the first of its kind in the world to offer several configurations of road courses, both long and short, plus a major drag strip utilizing the long back straightaway. Riverside was among the very first of the major road circuits built in the United States. Watkins Glen had opened only a year earlier, while at the same time Laguna Seca ran its first race 500 miles to the north on the Monterey Peninsula. But for the most part, Road racing was carried out on small airport circuits and tiny venues that would accommodate only slow production sports cars. Riverside, on the contrary, was a massively ambitious undertaking intended to serve a variety of motorsports activities. This had never been attempted on such a grand scale any place else in the world. It was but one of a dozen major road courses and speedways built during the boom years of the 1950s but none equaled it in terms of its scope and diversity. Ironically, the driver who had come to dominate the track was a local kid with dreams of becoming one of the greatest racing drivers in history, a goal many believe he reached with ease. I was born on, in Port Jefferson, Long Island, and lived in Manhasset, uh, the last town we lived in, which was also the home of my idol, uh, a fellow named Phil Walters who raced under the name of Ted Tappet at a speedway back there on Long Island named Freeport Speedway. And uh, 
my dad started to retire. He, he had one of these green thumbs and he wanted to uh, start growing oranges if he could, move to Riverside. I felt as though I was the uh, brer rabbit getting thrown into the briar patch. I mean, if, if there was a place in the world that I wanted to go, it was Southern California because of all the hot rod activity. In the beginning, I remember uh, riding my motorcycle along behind the uh, bulldozers as they were uh, smoothing out the, the pasture, so to speak, and uh, making the, the route for the racetrack. Uh, in fact, it was even going to be, I think, a five and a half mile track. Uh, and then later on, when plans changed a little bit, why it, uh, it ended up being shortened down to 3.1. Dan Gurney would be Riverside's homegrown superstar, joining his boyhood hero, the late Rex Mays, who was also a resident before his death in 1948. Within three years, the track had attained sufficient international stature to host the second annual United States Grand Prix for Formula One cars. Sadly, the event was a financial failure. Gurney ran well in front of his local fans, but like the race itself, failed to finish. When I did run at Riverside uh, in the uh, factory BRM, it was a big thrill. I mean, I had all my friends were out there and uh, uh, it was very special. I, I, had I lasted a little bit longer, it would have been even better, more special, but uh, that's racing. Searching for a home after failing first at Sebring, Florida in 1959, and then at Riverside the following year, the United States Grand Prix was transferred to Watkins Glen, New York, where it found a home for over two decades. Riverside uh, was not particularly particularly ready for Formula One at that time. And their crowd was probably uh, slightly less. And, and back east, the Watkins Land, the tradition of the, race, the racing that they had back there probably meant they were going to get a better crowd. And I, I suspect that that had something to do with it. Whether it was also uh, other competing sports or, or uh, sanctioning bodies, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a real uh, bucket of snakes. But Riverside came back from the failure stronger than ever, promoting, with the backing of the powerful Los Angeles Times, the biggest, richest sports car race in the nation. The popularity of the Times Grand Prix sports car race would set the stage for the famed Can-Am series, which remains to this day the high water mark in North American sports car competition. Then came the NASCAR stock cars, 1960s versions of today's Winston Cup machines, running in a series of 500 milers, backed by Motor Trend magazine. This time, the hometown boy was unbeatable, winning the big race four times in a row, 1963 to 1966, and again in 1968. Gurney's four consecutive victories in a 500 mile race still stands in the NASCAR record books. I raced stock cars there Quite a few times, ended up winning five 500-mile uh, stock car races there for NASCAR. Um, they were called uh, Grand Nationals at that time, and then which was the equivalent of what is uh, Winston Cup today. Uh, I also drove Indy cars there, uh, won a couple of races in Indy cars. Uh, they were the real cars that they ran at the Speedway in those days, at Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and ran also uh, Trans Am cars and uh, sports cars. So uh, can't think of a car that didn't run there. Riverside was a big boys racetrack, laden with tricky corners and an ultra-fast back straightaway. Sadly, it was lethal for some fine drivers including stock car ace Joe Weatherly, rising IndyCar star Billy Foster, and world-class sports car drivers Ken Miles and Rolf Stommelin. No one, not even Dan Gurney, took Riverside lightly. Uh, Riverside was unique in that it had approximately a one-mile straightaway, and you could get going, uh, I, I, well, in an IndyCar we were probably running 190, um, before the turn, the, the right-hand turn at the end of the straight, which had a minimum speed of probably 70, 75, 
Uh, in a sports car, we're probably running 180, and with a stock car, 160. Um, so uh, that last turn at the end of the straightaway led into what is the pit straight and where you enter and exit the pits, and then turn one with a left-hander, and it led into turn two, which was part of the S's, which uh, took a certain amount of uh, just getting the right rhythm and uh, working uh, your way through it. Uh, it took some finesse, led into turn six, which was uh, a little up a little ramp uh, into a right-hander where they had grandstands all the way around it there, and that was, uh, you had to have just the right gearing. Then, then there was a choice after six. You could either go right across to eight or keep turning right and go down to turn seven, seven A, and then back up to eight or nine. I forget now which, which number it was. And then it, in turn, would be a right-hander that would lead back into this, that long straightaway back down through. So it was, uh, I don't know how you'd compare it. It was unique. It, uh, there wasn't another track like it. Uh, so uh, I think the fans enjoyed it a lot. And, uh, you could get up close to the action. It was, it was a good track. The variety of cars and the men who drove them at Riverside has never been equaled at any other racetrack in the world. During its 30 years of prominence, the great track saw every type of serious racing machine, from Formula One cars, to Indianapolis cars, to NASCAR stock cars, to Can-Am cars, to Trans-Am cars. Champions of every discipline drove at Riverside, including yet another Southern Californian who, like Dan Gurney, dominated the track in every type of car he drove there. Well, I think, uh, you know, first of all, in its day, I think it was one of the finest racetracks that I've ever driven or uh, have ever seen actually. And what made it so unique is the fact that it was on kind of a side of the hill or, or one end was tremendous, uh, tremendously lower than the other end. And people could have a great view from turn six and see a good portion of the racetrack. But it also had all different kinds of challenges. I mean, it had, uh, of course, a long back straightaway and then it had a high speed uh, uh, corner at the end, uh, which was turn nine, and uh, had a high-speed corner of uh, one and two, and then it had the S's and it was great, and then, uh, uh, of course, turn six was uh, uh, quite a tight turn, and it had two different courses there. Uh, actually, it had three different courses. It had uh, uh, a real tight uh, turn at six, going back down into seven, which uh, had a rise in it, uh, and then a sharp left and then onto the back straightaway. But it also came back and went back up uh, and uh, toward the hills and made a much longer straightaway as well. So it really had about three different layouts of courses, but it was fabulous. I mean, it was uh, truly a, a great uh, racetrack that we lost. In 1970, the massive multi-million dollar Ontario Motor Speedway was constructed less than 20 miles to the west, and many predicted the early doom of Riverside. But thanks to the brilliant management of an ex-Los Angeles Rams linebacker named Les Richter, it was Riverside that prevailed, while Ontario plunged into bankruptcy and oblivion within a decade. One of the most fascinating characters tied with Riverside is a guy by the name of Les Richter, who was uh, a former LA Rams superstar uh, also a great USC football player that was tied in with the investment group that started Riverside. So Les kind of got eased into the deal. He didn't know a lot about racing, but it turned out that he was a brilliant organizer and promoter, and he really was the man that made Riverside happen. Everybody respected him as a, as a tremendous executive presence. He now, uh, uh, he, after Riverside closed, he went on to work with NASCAR and International Speedways Corporation, still is involved in automobile racing. And Les Richter, uh, is really the kind of engine of, of, uh, of uh, organization and behind the scenes uh, strength that kept Riverside in business. Really an interesting man. But Riverside's days were numbered as well. The track was once isolated from the encroachment of the exploding population of Los Angeles. But by the mid-1980s, 
the riverside suburbs were surrounding the track like an unstoppable fungus, swallowing up acreage on almost a daily basis. In the end, it was too much. Land values soared to the point where the track's owners had no choice but to sell out to developers for prices unimaginable when the great track had been built. I mean, Riverside was close, very close while I was living in Riverside. And uh, then we moved to Costa Mesa. It was still very close. And it's close to Santa Ana. Uh, it's funny, that used to be uh, about a two-hour drive, really going hard. Now today, it's probably 45 minutes uh, with the difference in roads. It was a lot more scenic in those days. Today, clusters of houses dot part of the old track, although bits of its corners and straightaways are visible to passers-by on the adjacent freeway. Riverside International Raceway is no more, but its heritage as the first multi-purpose motorsports facility in the world lives on. My understanding of why Riverside went out of business is that the owners of the racetrack had always thought they would hold this land until it was time to build a community there and the track was never intended to last and it lasted a little bit longer than they thought it would but they adhered to their original plan which i think it was a mistake but that's beside the point point. and finally uh, it was turned into a housing development actually i drove the last race of my career there I also, uh, the win when we uh, came from behind and won the 300 mile Rex Maze 300, the first one in 1967, that was uh, quite a highlight. And the five stock car victories actually was, there was another one, it was a 300 miler where I won a uh, uh, 150 miler and finished second in, a, in the other one and ended up uh, winning, but they disqualified me. All of those were great memories. Uh, uh, the Corvette drive that helped get the career started, the same with uh, actually uh, the, the time I first drove Frank Arciero's 4.9 Ferrari, I ended up getting uh, passed on the last lap or two by Carroll Shelby in a four and a half liter Maserati. And uh, he was very uh, kind to me and made some uh, complimentary remarks at the victory dinner that, that night, and that, that also was a, a big help to uh, uh, climbing up the ladder, so to speak. So all those memories are uh, very special. It has a tremendous history, and just for it to disappear, uh, you know, it's like cutting a piece out of your life, really. Within months of the opening of Riverside International Raceway, another totally different racetrack was generating enthusiasm within the core of the booming megalopolis. It would be called Ascot, a name that has been attached to no less than four other Southern California racetracks since before World War I. Ascot Park was a half-mile oval dirt track located in Gardena, near the intersections of the busy San Diego and Harbor freeways making it easily accessible to thousands of Los Angeles racing fans. Much confusion has been generated over the years because Ascot Park was but one of three dirt tracks located in Gardena. The first was Carroll Speedway, a half mile oval that operated from 1940 to 1954. Gardena Speedway was a one third mile dirt oval that opened in 1954 and ran until 1967. Like its earlier neighbor, it succumbed to unstoppable residential development pressure. Because Ascot Park was located in an industrial area, away from desirable private home properties, it managed to survive longer. But in the end, the booming Los Angeles demand for land spelled its doom as well. Like Dan Gurney, who grew up near Riverside's great track, Parnelli Jones was raised in nearby Torrance and would come to view the rough and tumble oval as his home track. When I first started uh, racing uh, Ascot, it was uh, 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 mostly uh, late model stock cars, sprint cars, and midgets, 
uh, some jalopy races, some you know early stock car racing, but uh, mostly midgets and sprint cars and stock cars. And uh, it was a half mile clay oval in our backyard. The racetrack was built in 1958, 59. I think it was 1959 we ran, uh, or 58, we ran uh, three 500 mile uh, races there. We ran uh, in three days. We ran a uh, 500 mile midget race and a 500 mile sprint car race and a 500 mile stock car race. And I ran all three of those races. Uh, I finished second with the midget uh, and was beat by Alan Heath, and then I fell out in the sprint car race. I also was leading the stock car race for 400 miles and was long gone, had a tremendous lead, and the car blew the engine. And, uh, but that, uh, that was when, when you had to be, I don't know, Popeye, I guess, because running three races in three days, I mean, uh, when, when that was over, you're pretty tired. Parnelli Jones would master every form of racing he tried. Midgets, sprint cars, sports cars, Indianapolis cars, Trans Am cars, and off-road machines. A display of virtuosity unmatched in motorsports history. If there was a single man who recognized his extraordinary talent, it was the promoter of Ascot Park, the late J.C. Agajanian, whose car carried Jones to victory in the Indianapolis 500 in 1962. It was the promotional genius of J.C. Agajanian that elevated Ascot Park to a point where it was perhaps the most famous dirt track in the world. Of course, being located in the heart of Car Mad Los Angeles didn't exactly hurt its reputation. Ascot was remembered for uh, basically its name, uh, and the Agajanians who uh, promoted the races there. Uh, I hated to see them, you know, give it up. I mean, uh, there was a lot of reasons why that happened, but uh, that ground is still there. They have never done anything with it, uh, although they had some promises that they were going to uh, do something with it. And uh, But the uh, Ascot, uh, the name, because they used to have an old Ascot, and, uh, and the fact that it was in the L.A. area, I mean, you've got a tremendous amount of people uh, naturally in Los Angeles, and, and it was a major dirt track uh, not too far from the city, so to speak. Like Gurney with Riverside, Parnelli Jones' linkage with Ascot served to elevate him to international prominence, and it was a local connection he never forgot. Ascot here being there in our backyard, uh, uh, and it was a great clay track. Uh, uh, you could get a lot of traction, and. Uh, it was a fun racetrack to drive. It had long straightaways and real tight turns, so you really had to cross the car up a great deal to slow it down at the end of the straightaway. And uh, it threw a lot of mud in the grandstand. Following a relatively brief career in championship racing, during which he won the Indianapolis 500 once and came within a few laps of winning it a second time in 1968, Parnelli Jones retired. Unlike its notorious predecessor, Legion Ascot, which was a 5 8 mile track located adjacent to Alhambra that closed in 1936 after claiming over 20 drivers in a 10-year span, Ascot Park was fast and relatively safe. Each Saturday night, through the warm summers, the stands would be packed to watch the sprint cars, stalkers, and midgets do battle. Before he moved on to the Indianapolis machinery, Parnelli Jones was a regular competitor in many cars, including Agajanian's number 98 Offy Midget, although not without a few miscues. Like the great board super speedways located in Beverly Hills and Culver City in the 1920s, Ascot Park was a wintertime refuge for many Eastern racing stars who came west for the lengthy Southern California racing season, hopefully to soak up some sun and some extra money during their stay. Since the first dirt ovals were built in Los Angeles in 1903, historians have traced the existence of over 100 tracks of all kinds, dirt and paved ovals, road courses, hill climbs, and drag strips, 
that thrived at one time or another in the area. Long forgotten is the elegant Beverly Hills board track, a one and a quarter mile high banked board speedway that was among the world's greatest during its brief life from 1920 to 1924. But the curse of all racetracks in Los Angeles, spiraling real estate demands, spelled its doom. Of the 100 motorsports venues that did business within the confines of the vast urban center, not one remains in business today, although Ascot managed to hang on the longest. But like Riverside, time was playing a ruthless game against Ascot Park. Los Angeles real estate was booming by the late 1980s, and enormous pressures were brought to bear on the property. Finally, the Agajanian family's lease on Ascot Park ran out in 1990, and the wonderful old track was closed. Ironically, a series of financial misadventures prevented development of the site, and today, Ascot remains a weedy plot of dirt, unused and almost forgotten. Uh, seeing uh, Ascot uh, with the mounds when they started tearing it down and taking all the crash wall out and the pieces and, and the, uh, but the ground was still there. I mean, the, you know, the racetrack was still there and the, you know, they, of course they had a big mound for the grandstands and that was still there and uh, uh, sad day. That's the last time I really, you know, made an attempt to go look and see what it looked like after it had basically been destroyed. Watkins Glen, New York has been synonymous with automobile racing since the fall of 1948, when the first amateur sports car races were run through the otherwise sleepy village at the foot of Lake Seneca. Today, an immense road course hosts a variety of major NASCAR events, including a prestigious Winston Cup race that attracts over 100,000 fans each August. But a few miles away, across a gravel country road, lies the true Watkins Glen heritage. Here is the original mile road circuit where it all started, where modern American sports car racing began. Today, it's merely a collection of lightly traveled back roads. How this tiny village became an international center of motor racing that has hosted every major form of road racing, including Formula One, can be credited to a single man's vision. A man by the name of Cameron Argetsinger, who is the key man in, 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 in Watkins Glen history, he was a world, young World War II veteran. His family had a summer place in Watkins Glen on, on Lake Seneca. He got the idea that they could revive racing, kind of European style road racing, in the streets of Watkins Glen. And he somehow, I don't know how he did it, but he convinced the city fathers this is going to be a good deal for tourism. So they laid out this uh, road course, this natural, just on natural highways around the surrounding countryside and down the main street of Watkins Glen. It was an amazing uh, kind of phenomenon. I, my father took me there when I, in 1951, I think it was, something like that. I was a young kid. I sat on a bank and watched the Cunninghams run with John Fitch and Phil Walters, all these great drivers going around. And then in 1952, uh, a young boy who was sitting on the curb was hit by one of the cars and killed and uh, it caused an incredible uproar. Uh, New York State banned racing on state highways there. Still, the ban remains in effect to this day. So the Glen, having developed an interesting kind of tourism deal, and a, a lot more people were coming than they ever expected to, they thought it was a pretty good deal. But they didn't know what to do, so they went up and they moved the racetrack up to, onto a network of, of county roads in the town of Dix, which is up north of uh, just where this current racetrack is. That didn't work very well. It was not a very good uh, network of roads. So they built, in 1956, 57, uh, uh, an artificial racetrack, which is the layout of which still exists on the current racetrack. It was then expanded in the early 1970s 
to accommodate Grand Prix racing. See, the United States Grand Prix was very successful. They were getting thousands of people coming in and out of that place every year in October for the Grand Prix. And, but the uh, Formula One people wanted a more elaborate facility, so they expanded it. They expanded it too much. They went bankrupt. And um, it stayed uh, basically a bankrupt, fallow racetrack until Corning Glass invested in it in the, in the middle 1980s and revived it. And now, of course, the International Speedways Corporation, the parent company of NASCAR, owns the racetrack and has brought back Winston Cup racing. So it, it was, it's been a checkered career for a, for a major racing facility, much like Riverside on the West Coast, that has uh, been uh, the, the, uh, the scene of every possible kind of automobile that you can see has raced around Watkins Glen, much like Riverside. So there, there are interesting parallels between the two racetracks. It was Cameron Argetsinger who triggered the boom in Watkins Glen Motorsports, but he was quickly joined by a brave collection of enthusiastic amateur sportsmen eager to race their sports cars over the Schuyler County countryside above the village. One was a former P-51 fighter pilot named John Fitch. I raced there first in 49 in a TCMG. Uh, it was a mixed field. Uh, there were a number of other MGs in it, and the only car in my class, which Tommy Cole's HRG, was a 1500cc engine larger than mine at 1250 and uh, I came in fifth overall. This includes all of the hot cars and the big cars and the name cars and if you've uh, seen or driven a TCMG you realize it's kind of a motorized roller skate <coughs> and very unsophisticated. Like hundreds of World War II veterans, John Fitch had come home infused with a newfound enthusiasm for European sports cars. Smaller, lighter, more nimble and often faster than the soft-sprung domestic products, these machines formed the basis for the new sports car craze. It would be the MGs and the rakish Jaguar XK120 Roadster that would generate a revolution in sports cars that continues to this day. Those uh, early races were experimental in every sense of the word. Uh, the people who ran the race uh, had no experience, and the people who drove in the race had no experience either. We just didn't know better. For instance, one of the best examples, unfortunately a tragic one, is uh, the fact that the spectator protection consisted of snow fence and people literally stood on the curb, or sat on it, was even worse. <clears throat> but from a driver's point of view, this was a high crown, narrow, bumpy road with absolutely no safety provisions, ditches on either side, and trees and all kinds of hazards. And that was really unknown territory for all of us. Since the end of the great Vanderbilt Cup races run before World War I and ill-fated attempts to revive them on Long Island in 1936 and 37, road racing in the United States had practically disappeared. A tiny club based in the Northeast ran a few minor road races in places like Briarcliff Manor and Alexandria Bay in upstate New York during the 1930s. But these were pure amateur events that attracted but a handful of rich sportsmen and their low-powered imported roadsters. No permanent road courses existed, and any competitions that were organized ran on open roads, with but a few hay bales tucked around adjacent trees and telephone poles. This would be the environment faced by the drivers who appeared at Watkins Glen on October 2nd, 1948, for what was billed as the first Watkins Glen Grand Prix, an eight-lap, 53-mile contest for large displacement sports cars over a 6.6-mile course that started and finished on the village's main street. The narrow roads, some graveled, coursed through a state park and crossed a bumpy set of railroad tracks before plunging over 500 feet through a 100-mile-per-hour sweeping bend into the heart of the little town.
The notion of racing on open public roads is unthinkable today, lined as they were with ditches, mailboxes, curbs, and stout trees. Moreover, the driver's only protection was a light leather helmet and a crude seatbelt. No fireproof clothing, no fuel cells, no roll bars, and no shoulder harnesses to protect them as they faced one of the most chillingly dangerous racetracks in the world. You can imagine driving at uh, 130 or 40 miles an hour on a <clears throat> high crown, narrow country road, passing other cars. Um, for instance, the railroad underpass with the bumps and the high speed, you, you sort of aimed at this hole <laughs> in, the, in the hillside. Uh, and uh, of course, the sweep down to the main street. So least a quarter of a mile, maybe a half, and everybody over revved their engines and just uh, forgot about everything else and went as fast as they could, which was quite fast. <laughs> Amazingly, during the five years that racing took place on the original Watkins Glen circuit, only two people were killed. One, a sports car racing pioneer named Sam Collier died while fighting for the lead in the 1950 Grand Prix. A monument marks the spot and is still covered with flowers on each racing weekend at the track. The most uh, <clears throat> alarming feature of the course, uh, this is mostly in retrospect because at the time we simply didn't know any better. There weren't any dedicated tracks that were built for safety. This was just public roads and uh, Driving around it in recent years, in fact, last month, it's just inconceivable that a race could be run on, on a circuit like that. The second fatality in 1952 was far more serious and amplified the fact that crowd control at Watkins Glen was non-existent. By then, spectator counts had risen to perhaps 25,000 and most fans were unhindered in terms of access to the course beyond being restrained by a few ropes and a ragged barrier of snow fencing. A young boy was seated on the curb along Main Street when a race car veered sideways under hard braking and skidded into the crowd. The child was killed while 12 others were injured. Outraged by the accident, New York enacted a law forbidding racing on its state roads that remains in effect to this day. The accident was perhaps a blessing in disguise, and that the chaos that surrounded the entire six miles of the circuit invited a massive disaster that could have taken the lives of dozens. Banned from the original road course, the organizers of the race, local volunteers and merchants, created a makeshift rectangle of roads in the nearby town of Dix that served as a temporary circuit until the fall of 1956, when the outlines of the current track were created. The new Watkins Glen track, a pear-shaped 2.3 mile configuration that permitted lap speeds approaching 100 miles an hour when the Formula One cars made their exodus from Riverside in 1961, was an instant success, helped in no small part by the thousands of Canadian enthusiasts who poured over the border from Toronto and Montreal to watch the Grand Prix. The arrival of the Grand Prix circus, led by the world-famous Sterling Moss, the legendary Ferrari team, and other international cars and stars was the triggering mechanism for Watkins Glen's ascension to the top rank of the sport. But the fame was owed in many ways to the intrepid spirit of pioneer sportsmen like John Fitch. Without him and his cohorts and their little MGs and other British sports cars flailing around the original Glen circuit, this wonderful old track's 50th birthday would never have been celebrated. With a little, the little experience they had in two or three races, they realized this is a dangerous place to run races and really inappropriate. And then Sam Collier had been killed, and then when the young boy was killed, uh, that um, was a clear signal that they couldn't continue with that. And there wasn't any physical way to make it safe. I mean, you can't put up uh, uh, barriers all around, of course, it was impossible then. They do that now on street races when they spend a few hundred thousand dollars to, to do it, but uh, it was impossible then. 
and the alternative was to pick another circuit out of the town where it could be safer. That ran for a couple of years, and then they built the dedicated course that they have now. The current Watkins Glen International Racetrack that hosts the Winston Cup stock cars each August is a far cry in terms of safety, speed, and spectator comfort from the crude network of roads that formed the original course. But surely without it, and pioneers who raced on it, the current track would no doubt be simply more acreage of fallow farmland overlooking Lake Seneca. Historians have totted up over 6,000 racetracks, including drag strips, that have dotted the nation. Nearly every town in the country has been the scene of an automobile race over the past century. For the most part, the old speedways and road courses are plowed under, buried beneath shopping centers, office towers, and four-lane highways. A few road circuits like that at Watkins Glen remain as forgotten public highways, but a majority have met a similar fate to that of Riverside and Ascot, totally obliterated, with only a few earthen scars as evidence of their existence. To many older race fans, these legendary venues of speed will never be forgotten, although with the passage of years, they will surely fade deeper into history. Who knows today, the giant banked, bored super speedways once thrived in Beverly Hills and Brooklyn, New York, or that a shopping center in Langhorne, Pennsylvania covers the fastest, most dangerous one-mile dirt track in history. The famed road course at Bridgehampton, Long Island, built the same year as Riverside, may be the next to fall under the bulldozer's blade, another victim of real estate encroachment. There was a kind of elemental charm about, uh, about uh, those, uh, those racetracks, a lot probably about, like old baseball players would say that uh, uh, the old stadiums or the, the, great, uh, the great natural turf football stadiums were, uh, were different than the artificial turf and the dome stadiums today. Uh, the atmosphere has changed radically with, uh, with racetracks. It's much more slicker, it's uh, more efficient, it's, they're, they're beautiful, they're, they're, they're seamless in their own way, they're safe, there's no, uh, there's there a lot of the kind of, uh, of elemental vitality has been taken away. Uh, and replaced by a very, very much more commercial, much more successful uh, form of motor racing. But uh, in the old days, there was a kind of uh, 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 brotherhood between, uh, uh, there was an accessibility to the drivers. There was a, a, a sense of higher risk, I think. I mean, these, the, there was, it was dangerous. And uh, the cars were, were more primitive, but they were, uh, I, I've often said the neat part about racing in those days was that nobody knew anything. I mean, people were experimenting with all different kinds of race cars. So when you went to a racetrack, you never knew who was going to show up with some sort of a nutball uh, new race car. The drivers were, were had a much more uh, a kind of uh, sense of adventure. There was a kind of uh, 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 raffish kind of devil may care quality about them. They weren't uh, beholden to sponsors like they are. They don't mouth, uh, uh, they aren't forced to mouth uh, 17 different sponsors names every time they're uh, getting victory lane. You know, it was a different world. Uh, they, the, the pits weren't full of guys walking around with cell phones and, uh, and briefcases. It was, uh, it wasn't as commercial. It was, there was a kind of uh, primitive charm about racing that I really love and I really miss it today. And so it is with great lost racetracks. Gone, but not forgotten. The sights of great drivers, great cars, and great races. Places that for all the progress and the ravages of the urban glut will never disappear from the lore of our great sport. But there is an upside to this tale. While we have lost a number of great tracks over the years, the current boom in automobile racing has seen a number of super tracks rise in their place. Ultra-fast, luxurious speedways have recently been constructed at Fontana, California, just a few miles from Riverside, at Colorado Springs, Dallas-Fort Worth, and Las Vegas. This is part of the natural life cycle of sporting facilities, be they racetracks or baseball parks. Age, shifting population patterns, marketing tastes, and the infusion of new capital ends the life of one and begins that of another in a never-ending replacement process. Fontana, while not a pure road course like Riverside, 
abundantly serves the current appetites of the California racing fans. The only thing that can stop progress is even more progress. And in this sense, the passing of these lost racetracks has perhaps been a good thing. Had they remained in place, it would have implied stagnation in the sport, wherein there would have been no demand for improvement. But in their own way, these three fabled venues, Riverside International Raceway, Ascot Park, and the original Watkins Glen Road Course, serve as cornerstones for the golden age we enjoy today. In that sense, we celebrate not only their glory years, but their passing into history as three of our most venerated lost racetracks. George Santayana, the great Spanish philosopher, once said that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Surely he wasn't referring to lost racetracks, but his warning makes sense. Lost racetracks died because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Hopefully, those who have currently invested millions in new elegant super speedways have paid attention to the past, learning from the errors in planning that caused the demise of places like Riverside and Escott. Thankfully, much has changed in the half century that has passed since they were built. But now that automobile racing has truly entered the major leagues of sport, caution and prudence must always govern future decisions, lest a few years hence, the lavish facilities of today enter the realm of lost racetracks.